Um, so, okay, so today I'm gonna be talking to you guys about sea stars, which you may know alternatively as starfish. Um, here in the Atlantic Ocean, we all live near the Atlantic Ocean. So these are all animals that live in your backyard, that on your coastline that you can go see. So first, um, I wanna talk a little bit about climate change. Does anybody know what climate change is? Has anyone heard that term before? Yeah. yeah. Ezra, go ahead. It's, um, it's the warming of the oceans and, and I, it's like everything is gonna go up mm -hmm. a few degrees and what that will mean for thousands of people, millions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So everything. So climate change is the process of our planet warming up on average, but that doesn't mean it's going to get warmer everywhere. Some places might get warmer. Some places might actually get colder. But the entire planet, um, on average, all together, is going to be warmer. Um, and that's caused by a few a few different things, including the burning of fossil fuels. So like the gas in your car. Uh, yeah. but also uh, forms of industrial farming. So um, these huge farms that have hundreds and hundreds of cows and um, cause it are also emitting chemicals into the atmosphere that are causing global warming, as well as the deforestation of the planet, which means cutting down the trees in the forests of our planet. These are all factors mm -hmm. that are causing climate change. And the reason why I want to talk about this is because one of the big focuses of my talk today is the changes that are going on in the ocean and with starfish in particular. So what are some of the consequences of global war, of, of climate change? So we talked about some of the, the reasons why it's happening, but what are some of the things we're gonna see happen due to climate change? I think Ezra already brought some of, some of these points up. So Ezra, if you wanted to talk, to talk unless someone else had their hand up. I can't really see everyone's videos. So yes, Ezra, go ahead. Um, like animals die. Yep, and, extinction. Yeah. And mm -hmm. the, the, ocean. mm -hmm. the ocean's getting warmer. It's also getting more acidic, right? So here are some of the consequences of climate change. This is not everything. This is just like a list of the big ones. <laughs> um, so we're going to have a lot more unpredictable weather that's a lot more dangerous. So things like more hurricanes, more um, high power storms, droughts. So, you know, less less water and less rain in some parts of the of the world. Sea level will be rising. Um, so the coastlines are going to the water are going to start creeping up the coastlines. Um, ocean might be getting more acidic as well as warmer. And we're also, as as we said, going to have wildlife extinctions. And so what I study mostly is the coastline of the ocean, right? So I'm not going out on like boats into the deep sea or anything. I'm studying the ocean right at the shoreline. Um, and it's a really important part of the ocean um, because first of all, uh, it is one of the most economically important parts of the, of the planet. Lots of people want a beach house and lots of people want to go stay at a hotel on a beach, right? So it's one of the most highly developed and highly sought after expensive kind of properties. So there's a lot of pressure to develop these areas and not keep them pristine and the same as, as they were. Um, and one of the reasons why that's not a good thing is because they're really, really important for the environment. They provide us with a lot of uh, important services. So here is a picture of a little tiny baby lobster. <laughs> um, so lobsters are really, really cute. Um, they look exactly the same when they're babies as they do when they're adults. They're just tiny versions. Um, and lobsters are obviously really expensive, right? When we want to eat them, we have to pay a lot of money. <laughs> um, and so they're a really economically important thing from, for the, for especially New England. And lobsters live their first couple of years um, right at the coastline um, in what we call the intertidal zone, the area between high and low tide, um, because it's a really safe place for them. There aren't big fish or other big animals to eat them. 
So lots of animals spend the first couple years of their lives um, uh, in this area that's very exceptionally safe, and then they move on to the ocean. So it's really important to keep the end, uh, the, the marine coastline also buffers our, our cities from storms. So if we keep them intact, don't put cities right on top of them, <laughs> there's a little bit of buffer there from we have re these really big hurricanes and storms. Uh, yeah, Darian, you had a question? How, yeah, my question was, how about like um, shrimp? Does, is that affected by climate change too? Yeah, yeah, they're very much affected by climate change. So shrimp are also, um, you find them in this area between high and low tide. Um, and they also um, have, are under a lot of threat because they're developing these areas that are normally shrimp habitats. Um, they also um, are affected by the ocean becoming more acidic. So shrimp have these little shells on them, right? When you peel a, you have to peel a shrimp and take its shell off to eat it, right? Um, and they are unable to build that shell effectively. So they can't build their shell properly when the ocean is more acidic than it should be. So they're under a lot of threat. And that's why there's a lot of shrimp farms now. So they can't really find the same numbers of shrimp as they used to um, in the ocean. They have been overfished. So people have been taking too many of them out and they're also not doing well for other reasons. So now we're farming them. Um, and so most of the shrimp you find in the supermarket has, been com has come from a shrimp farm. Mm. I thought I saw another hand up. Did someone else have a question? Yeah, Paula. I also am concerned about like animals that live in a habitat that people destroy with fire. Mm -hmm. And also my father is allergic to sh lobster. He can't have it. Also his, a, he to could, his esophagus could freeze up. He could eat the shrimp. But I'm really concerned about the animals and the habitats that are being destroyed by these people. And not mm -hmm. to mention the animals being killed by poachers. I'm just so tired and it makes me really upset about it. Yeah, yeah, that is a big problem, um, especially poaching in some parts of the world. So places like, like Africa have a really big problem with poaching of large animals like lions and rhinos, things like that. Um, there isn't a lot of poaching going on in the ocean, luckily. Um, and obviously fire isn't a big concern for the ocean, um, but it is a big concern in places like California, right? Where there's a lot of wildfires. Mm -hmm. And my mom's also allergic to lobster, Paula. So. <laughs> um, so specifically in the coastline, I study what's known as the rocky intertidal zone. So I mentioned this before, but the intertidal zone is the area between high and low tide. So sometimes you go to the beach, right? And the water is really, really far away and there's lots of seaweed in the sand. And that's because it's at low tide and the water has gone out. Mm -hmm. And if you stuck around for like 10 more hours, you would, you would be there at high tide and the tide will have come back in and covered up all that seaweed. So, that's but so there, there are lots of animals that live in that area between high tide and low tide. We call those intertidal animals. And it's a super extreme environment, as you can imagine, right? These animals have to be able to live on land and in the ocean at the same time, right? Half the day they spend in the water and half the day they spend in the sun. So they're really cool animals that live here. Um, and specifically, I study intertidal uh, environments that are on ro in rocky shores. So some intertidal environments are on sandy shores, right? So if you go to Cape Cod, um, you're going to see a lot of sandy beaches and that has a bunch of different types of animals than somewhere that would have a rocky beach so somewhere like blue hill or acadia or in lots of other parts of maine um and because seas and because uh intertidal animals live in both the ocean and on land they are um under threat from uh, from things on both of those uh systems right so all the things that you worry about with land animals and all the things you worry about for ocean animals, sea stars and, you know, uh, sea urchins and all of these intertidal animals have to worry about both of those things <laughs> because they're, they live on both of those types of environments. So for that reason, they're really important to study 
um, to understand what's going to happen with climate change because they're sort of like our early warning system. Um, they're under some of the most threat. And this is what I study here. It's a sea star, also known as a starfish. Has anyone ever seen a starfish in the wild or have, or maybe in a touch tank at an aquarium? Yeah, Ezra has seen it in a, probably in Maine. And um, sorry, I don't remember your name because your name on Zoom is Godzilla. Oh, sorry, my name is Max. Max, okay. I, I just like customizing <laughs> my name, sorry. Yeah, I know, it's a really cool name. I just, sorry, I forgot your, I forgot what you had said it was. Yeah, so uh, they're, they can be kind of tough to find in the wilds, but they, um, they're super cool, right? You can hold them. They have these little tube feet and stuff. Um, so um, I'm actually going to skip over this, but there's, um, there are about 1,500 species of starfish that we've described, um, and they're all super different from each other. So you probably know of the classic starfish, right? It's probably something that's like on the bottom left there. That's like a, that's an ochre sea star that's found in the West Coast. It's the purple and orange, right? You see pictures of those a lot, but, but not all starfish have five legs. Um, some of them like this one up in the top right is called a crown of thorns starfish. It is actually venomous um, and it eats corals. So it like, it's very invasive to um, the Great Barrier Reef. It walks around on the reef and it eats up all the corals. And if you touch one of the spikes, it's not like deadly venomous, but it will give you a little bit of a rash. <laughs> um, and so the bottom right there, that is a sunflower star. It's also purple and they can have like 36 legs. They're also just enormous. They can be like the size of a manhole cover, like the size of a, of a car tire, those things. Wow. Yeah, they're amazing. They're also found mostly on the West Coast, so. Don't go looking for those over here. Um, and then my favorite sea star is the one on the top left. It's called a, a slime star. Um, and as a way of defending itself from other animals eating it, um, it coats itself in a layer of toxic slime as soon as you try to pick it up. Um, it's super cool. It's one of my very favorite animals. Um, this is me holding one <laughs> in, also on the West Coast. Um, so, uh, sea stars also have just really cool biology. They, they use their, they use these things called tube feet for their movement. So if you could look on the top right there, you see these little suction cups coming out of the bottom of the sea star, right? That's how they move around. And those suction cups are totally just powered by water. Um, so they pull water into their bodies and they use the water to fill up these suction cups and walk around on them. <laughs> um, and they also um, eat in a really cool, specific way. So sea stars love to eat things like mussels and clams. And so they use those little tube feet. If you look on the bottom left there, this is a sea star trying to pull a mussel open. So they use these tube feet that stick onto the, the mussel. And then they just pull the mussel open. Sometimes take, it takes like an hour to get this mussel shell open. I've heard about this. You've heard about this? It's really cool, right? So right. then they take their stomach, which is on the bottom right there. You can see this little balloon that's like kind of hanging over this sea star. That's its stomach. It's able to take its stomach out of its own body, put it inside the muscle shell and di digest the muscle shell inside <laughs> its own shell and pull that like semi-digested muscle. Yeah. Isn't that back hurt starfish? I'm sorry. I'm just, yeah. I'm just a hurt. It doesn't hurt the starfish, does it? No, it doesn't hurt the starfish. No, it doesn't at all. Um, so they are some of the only animals that can do this and ha that can eat these types of animals so easily. Um, the other cool thing about starfish, which you may have heard of before, is that they can regenerate. So if you cut off one of its limbs, which I don't <laughs> recommend doing because it does hurt the starfish, <laughs> um, it can regrow that limb. And some species of starfish, um, that's how they breed, basically. They like drop their limbs and just make another version of themselves. Because like they can make, some starfish can even make like all, all four of their other limbs from their one limb, as long as part of their central body is left at the tip of the limb. Yeah, Ezra, you another question? All right, and tomorrow I'm a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if, if like, they, if they're in a fight, they, they can just regrow their arm, which is totally awesome. I mean, yeah. 
We can't do that. And yeah, we can't do that. Yeah. This is one of the reasons people study animals like this to try to like understand how they do it and how maybe one day we can figure out how to regrow things <laughs> for ourselves. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they're pretty amazing in that way. And, you know, I can tell you as someone who's picked up a lot of sea stars, <laughs> they do just drop their arms sometimes out of fear because it's a really good way to try to get away right from some from something like you you just sacrifice your one leg you can grow it back and you just swim away so they do drop some of them are quicker to drop than others but yeah they, they do that as a defense mechanism it's cool yeah so sea stars are what we call a keystone species um, so they're really important to the environment and i'm gonna explain to you what that means um, so let's say we have a group of animals in the inner title right so we have a lobster and a crab, right? And we have sea star over there. Um, and we have some plants and we have some mussels, right? With, you can see the mussel with a little orange uh, piece of meat in there. <laughs> so this is, a, this is the sea star, right? And so there were some experiments that some researchers did in the 60s. And they wanted to see what would happen if sea stars were gone, if sea stars were removed from the environment. So they took all the sea stars from certain beaches and they just like threw them into the deep sea or just like put them in a touch tank or something. They just completely removed them from certain beaches in Washington state on the West coast. And so this is what happened to the rest of the animals in that environment. Sea stars were gone. And so slowly, this is what we saw happen over time. So this is what we were left with, just a bunch of mussels. So it went from this, which, what we, which is what we call a diverse community, right? Lots of different species to just this, just some mussels. And that's what this looks like, right? This is a beach that's just covered in mussels. So can you guys guess why this may have happened on a be on when we removed the sea stars? Yeah, no, yeah, Ezra? Because uh, there was nothing to eat them. So yeah. the population exploded. It's exactly right. Exactly right. So sea stars are what we call a keystone species, which means they have a really, really big effect on the rest of their community. Sorry, there's someone I'm going to admit them to the talk. Um, so they have a really, really big effect on the rest of their community. Um, and um, they do this because they prefer to eat mussels over anything else. And, see, and mussels are what we call a dominant competitor. They can outcompete pretty much anything else because they can just like place themselves on a rock and they're almost impossible to pry off. So they just like take up all of this space and crowd everything else out. And the whole beach just becomes a mussel bed instead of a diverse community full of other animals. So sea stars kind of keep mussels in check. They keep them at the population level that they should be um, when they're there. When they're removed or when they start to go extinct, um, it becomes a problem because all of these other species get pushed out by mussels. So I work on two species of sea star that are in the Atlantic Ocean here in the North Atlantic, mostly uh, so between, you know, Canada down to Florida. And there are these two species in the genus Asterius. So Gen Asterius rubens is on the left. That's the more northern species. Asterius forbsi on the right is the more southern species. And so we know a little bit of history about this group of animals. So I'm just going to quickly go through this. So at one point in many millions of years ago, there was just one species of this, of this type of sea star called the Asteria sea star. And it was only on the Pacific. It was in the, on the West Coast, like sort of in the like um, Alaska area, right? Um, at some point, about three and a half million years ago, um, there was an opening um, that opened up, uh, that wasn't open before, it was covered in ice. And all of these sea stars came over to the Atlantic. Once they were here, they split into two separate species. And now there was one on, in Europe and there was one in North America. And then the European species came over here. <laughs> we don't know when that happened. 
but now they both ex they are both on the east coast of North America. So does any, can anyone guess what kind of science is used to figure this out? These like this history from millions of years ago, right? Nobody was around to see this happen, right? So what, what kind of science do you think we use to figure out what, how this happened? Any guesses? This is a really tough question and most people don't, don't get it. So lots of people guess fossils, right? So sometimes you can tell this with fossils, but sea stars, there aren't a lot of fossils of sea stars yeah. because they have kind of soft bodies. So it doesn't, they don't preserve well. So the way we know this is through genetics actually. So this is what <laughs> genetics research looks like. I spend most of my days looking at a computer screen with this on it. <laughs> so just like strings of DNA, right? And I have DNA from lots of different sea stars. So I have hundreds of samples and I compare them to each other. Um, and you can tell from the DNA of lots of different individuals from different places, what their history was. So you can, um, what we, we call infer the history of a population based on its genetics. And one of the questions I am asking with my research is whether or not these sea stars are hybridizing. Have you ever, has anyone ever heard of a hybrid? Yeah. yeah. Ezra, do you have, oh, and Paul, actually let's give it to Paula this time. So Paula, what is a hybrid? Well, I know I've heard like koi wolves that are hybrids and also wolf hybrids. I've also heard of a savannah cat, which is between a, serval and a house cat that's yeah that's exactly right so what do those things all have in common right you're breeding a they're serval hybrid. yeah you're breeding a serval with a house cat and you're getting a different species right? right so a hybrid is an animal that has a parent from parents from two different species and they're mm -hmm. able to breed together and make offspring or a, a, you know a baby so um for a long time, people thought that these two species were able to hybridize, but no one had ever been able to show it with genetics. So I went out and I did a bunch of sea star sampling. And that's what this looks like, okay? These are all pictures of me doing field work. Up on the top left, I'm in Nova Scotia. Does anyone know where that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? It's, in the, it's up in Canada in the Bay of Fundy. Um, some days you find... 40 sea stars on the same beach, right? That's just bucket full of sea stars. But most days you find almost none. They're really hard to find. Um, and I use my car as my mobile lab. <laughs> so I would pull my bucket of sea stars back to my car and then sample tube feet out of the sea stars. And then I would put them all back. So I didn't have to kill any sea stars for this research. Um, and sometimes I even used what I call, what we call a dry shipper. That's the thing in the middle there that has like smoke coming out of it <laughs> that instantly freezes your samples. So your DNA is perfectly preserved. Um, so it was super fun. I got to travel all over the country, well, all over the East Coast um, for several years looking for samples. Um, and here's what the genomes say, what, which is what my data says. So let's say we have sea stars on one side of a barrier, right? So this gray thing in the middle is our barrier. Let's say we have sea stars on one side of a barrier and sea stars on another side of a barrier. So they aren't able to cross, across, cross into the barrier, across the barrier and breed with each other, right? They're completely separated. Let's say there's like a giant seawall in between them. So this is what their gen genetics might look like, right? All of the ones on the left are gonna be completely different from all the ones on the right. All the ones on the left are green. All the ones on the right are orange. Now let's say that barrier goes away, right? This is what we might see. The ones that are close to each other might be able to breed with each other and then their genomes will look mixed, right? Does everyone understand? So this is what the actual data is showing. And I know this can be hard to understand and look at, but basically all of these bars are like in the previous thing here, one of each of these bars is an individual sea star. Um, and so this is what their genetics is showing. We're, there are lots of individuals in the middle there in New England that are uh, hybrids that are showing mixed genomes um, that have ant parents who are um, from one species and another parent that is from the other species. 
So that's really cool. And it seems to be happening more as the climate changes. Um, because the southern species that is used to warmer water is now moving northward. It's moving further north and taking over habitat in the, in the northern species uh, is, range. Sorry. I'm just curious, is the hybridization thing bad in the long run? Or what's the, uh, the prospects? I mean, sorry, just curious. Yeah, no, that's a, um, that's a really good question. <laughs> and I think it's a question that nobody knows the answer to because these things are really unpredictable. It could be good actually, because the, the more warm water adapted species is now becoming more dominant. So it could be more, better adapted for the warm water. Um, but it is causing um, the genetic diversity to, to decrease, right? So what we're seeing is lots of these sea stars are now gonna be, um, we're, we're losing a lot of the variation in sea stars, which might not be so good. Um, more variation means more opportunities to mm -hmm. adapt to the to an environment. <clears throat> so it's unpredictable what's gonna happen. Um, you know how you talked about the hybrid? I forgot to mention another one. You know how people breed a male lion versus a female Siberian tiger and they create laggers? Mm -hmm. I forgot that's a hybrid. That. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly hybrid. right. Mm -hmm. So um, just one more aspect of my research that I'm gonna talk about today. And I know, I'm sorry, I know I'm going a little over what we talked about, but um, one of the, the other things I, I wanted to know was how many sea stars are even out there? Because I was going out looking for sea stars and I was having a lot of trouble finding them. So the last time someone wrote about this was in the 70s, the 1970s, and they were finding sea stars all over the place. They were finding 20 sea stars per square uh, per quarter meter square. So like for like a box this big, they were finding 20 sea stars in it. And that was finding sea stars like once every other day, right? So it was a lot, it was a lot different. So I went back to the old paper um, from the seventies and I recreated it this past summer. And I was able to compare what it would used to be like in the seventies exactly to now using the exact same methods. So this, these methods um, were really, fun to do. I just laid down a, a rope that was five meters long at the low tide line. And I looked within a meter of either side of the rope. And I did this five times at the low tide line and also a little further in, like a little bit deeper. And so that's what this looks like. Some of the sites I went to were actually very inaccessible. So we had to row out to them. Um, so it was a really fun summer, but I weighed each sea star. I collected some tissue for um, the American Museum of Natural History's collection. Um, and I also measured the sea stars. Um, so here are my survey sites. It's just a map of New England. So lots of them were near or within Acadia National Park and some of them were down in Boston, Boston Harbor and finally a couple places in Cape Cod. And so this is, a, this is the change in sea stars over time. So the pink is our 1979 sea star data and the blue is our 2021 sea star data and mm -hmm. so we're seeing catastrophic declines in sea stars here really really low levels and in fact this is uh this is actually log scaled so it's not even the raw data it's like transformed to so you can ab more able to see the the, the 2021 data. So we're seeing really, really low levels of sea stars compared to what it was in 1979. And what we're also seeing is the sea stars actually moving into deeper water, which is interesting, um, possibly because the water's too warm um, and, the, and we're getting increased heat waves as well in the summer. Yeah, Ezra, you have a question? Uh, I need, I need findings of salmon. Right. Um, sorry, I didn't understand the question. Did I find these where? Um, oh, are these findings upsetting? Is yeah. that your question? Oh, yeah. very, very much so. <laughs> it's not surprising as someone who has spent a lot of time looking for them. It was very obvious that they had declined, but I didn't realize it was to this degree. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's change. Things are changing very quickly, and one of the reasons for that is the Gulf of Maine is warming up 
faster than 99% of the rest of the ocean. So it's pretty much, it's warming up more quickly than anywhere else in the world, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So another reason why this might be happening though is uh, there's a disease called sea star wasting. Um, and this is a disease, we don't really know the cause, but um, it causes uh, what we call lesions. So these like white spots on sea stars that, that eat away at the sea stars um, bony exterior and expose all their soft tissue. And so they, it's almost hundred percent lethal. Um, and so it's been, it's been sweeping through the population. Um, at, like it's, it's been sweeping through the population for many decades, but it's happening much more regularly now. And they, part of the reason is because the water is warming and diseases are much, much easier to spread in warm water and warm weather, right? So that's also one of the reasons we're seeing a big decline. And so I have a lot more research to do. So I'm gonna be trying to predict where the future of these species habitat is. Um, and I'm also interested to know, you know, what is this gonna mean for the rest of the community? We talked a lot about sea stars being keystone species, you know, um, and if they're declining so much, what does that mean for the rest of the community? And especially things like lobsters and cod that are really important to, for us to eat. Okay, so with that, I will take any additional questions that you guys have. Sorry, I went over time. I think Darian um, has our first question. Oh, yeah, Darian, go ahead. Um, so when we we go for a walk at our beach down here and we have found starfish on our beach, uh, what should we do with them? Should we put them back in the water or just leave them be? And will they eventually get back in the water themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, normally they can, if normally they aren't too, if, if you find them like on the ground, it's usually like really low tide and the tide will eventually come back in and cover them up. Now, if they look like, you know, they're really drying out or if they look like, you know, they're getting really like floppy. So, so if you pick up a Z star and it feel, feels really floppy, it's because there's no water in it. Um, and so it might be drying out. So that would be, it would be nice to put it back in the water. I think if you find them, if you find them on the beach, you can't really hurt them too badly. They're really actually hardy animals. So picking one up, putting it in the water is not going to hurt it. Yeah. We have another question here from Justin. Yes. Um, I was just curious. So like, you know, since the sea stars or starfish are so important, mm -hmm. um, I was just curious, like what, um, you know, people plan to do so we can save them so that way that they don't go extinct. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so there are, there are there aren't a lot of plans in place, um, unfortunately. Um, part of the reason for that is because um, you know there isn't a lot of funding for conservation, and the money that does get put forward for conservation often goes to things like large animals that people really love, like uh, you know tigers, and, <laughs> and you know so there's not a ton of conservation of invertebrates going on so an invertebrate is an animal that has no spine right yeah. so things like snails and sea stars and clams and things so um people are trying to um conserve the coastlines um so tr to try to conserve the habitat there's some people who are trying to make marine protected areas so areas that don't allow fishing or if they're fishing that they're very highly regulated and protected um, so those are the types of things that people are doing, just sort of trying to like minimize the habitat loss and fragmentation and development. Yeah, because like otherwise, like if everything went extinct, then there would be like nothing left for anybody, like or the species, you know, we wouldn't want the entire earth to go extinct. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm-hmm. Um, Melina, I'm wondering, you, you mentioned that you spend a lot of time looking at the sort of genetic code. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so like how often are you out in the field doing research and when will you go back to these locations? Yeah, so um, I only really do field work in the summer. Um, so most of the summer I'm on the road um, and, uh, but, and then most every other time of year, I'm mostly just doing data analysis. Yeah. There's a couple times here and there where I travel for, you know, conferences and workshops and things like that. Um, but mostly I'm an analyzing data until May or June and then I'm in the field until like September. So, uh, this, I'm not, I, I'm not sure if I'm going back into the field this summer, um, because I am supposed to be finishing up my PhD. <laughs> so, uh, we'll see, but if I get more funding, maybe. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see if there's any other questions. Mm -hmm. I, I have another one if no one else does, but um, I'm wondering about the um, wasting disease, I think you called it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I missed this, but um, is there any concrete information about the cause? And no. Yeah, so there is a couple of, um, so this has been a problem that's been studied in sea stars for like 40 years. Like it's, uh, it's been really, well documented on the west coast they've been they've had a, like so that big sunflower star that's like the size of a car tire that species has been really hard hit like it's it, it was really hard hit and it's not coming back as much um as some of the other species that have been affected um and there has been some evidence that there's a virus that's associated with the disease but um it's not like a it's not a definitive link. So some individuals that are tested have the virus and don't have signs of wasting disease. And some in individuals have wasting disease and they can't find traces of the virus. But it, there is an association. So like the more virus you have, the more likely you are to be showing symptoms. Um, so th there isn't like a, there isn't a clear answer what, to what's going on. One of the things that people think is, you know, there's so many stressors for sea stars right now. There's like loss of habitat. There's less muscles that they can eat. There is um, warming oceans and ocean acidification. And all these things are just like making us feel, making them feel weaker and weaker and their immunity is going down. And so they're more likely to get, catch this virus and then show symptoms after that. So sort of what's happening to everybody right now, right? We're just like all so tired and like burnt out and stressed out <laughs> that we're more likely to get sick, right? And get like, you know, so it's, uh, it, that's, that's the, the leading hypothesis right now. I have kind of a silly question. There are uh, no silly questions. No silly. Well, can, can sea stars, uh, yeah, sea stars catch corona? You know, I don't think they can. Yeah, that's a that's a that's not a silly question at all. That's a very good question. Um, so the less, the more closely related something is to uh to us, like the more likely it is to catch to be able to catch uh, COVID, right? So like your cat probably can catch it, your dog maybe, right? They may not show symptoms the way you do, but they, they can catch it because they're, they're a mammal. And so they're closely related to us. Sea stars are actually the most closely related invertebrate to us. Um, really? So like they are, yeah. So, um, you know, people think of like octopus, right? They have like eyes and they can open jars <laughs> and things. They're much less closely related to us than a sea star is. Like sea stars are, are, very, are very closely related to us, you know, comparatively. So, but they, but even so, they're very distantly related, right? Because they don't even have a spine, right? They have, they don't have a, like the same type of brain as us and stuff. So they, it's unlikely that they would be able to catch COVID. It, it's like they're too, I think they're too far removed from us. So the virus hasn't evolved to infect them. 
Plus it takes a different type of virus to infect something in the ocean than it does to infect something in uh, like the air. Um, it needs to have like saline tolerance and like a different type of protective like cell wall and things like that. But that's a very good question. And that's sort of why like you can, you're more likely, this is a tangent, but you're more likely to catch some kind of like parasite or uh, uh, yeah, or bacteria in fresh water than in salt water because it has a much more similar salinity to your body than the ocean does. <laughs> so it's easier to like infect you and they can survive in you as opposed to the ocean where like if they come into your body, it dies because your body is not as salty as the ocean. That's pretty fascinating. Makes sense too. <laughs> <laughs>